Good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you once again to another episode of the Medical City ITV. I'm one of today's hosts, Dr. Pauline Santiago. I am delighted to welcome you to episode five, When You Move, I Move, focusing on accommodative spasm. Before we begin, let us also welcome my co-host, Dr. Patricia Villa. Thank you, Dr. Pauline. I'm very glad that our section has finally hosted an episode, and I would like to thank our viewers for tuning in this afternoon. I believe this is totally different from our previous episodes and one that is very relatable during these times. That's true, Patty. Since the pandemic started, we have been glued to our computers for numerous educational and recreational online activities that have kept our eyes in constant work and strain. Zoom forever. Hence this topic, 
And because we will be discussing accommodative spasm, we will try to keep this episode brief but comprehensive. We would also like, uh, we would also highly appreciate it if we will have part participative spectators. So we are encouraging you all to type in your questions for our speakers in the YouTube comment section. And at any time during this show, we will take some time to answer all of them by the end of the lectures. Speaking of lectures, we have a great series lined up for you this afternoon. This is a collaborative effort by the Pediatric Ophthalmology Section of the Eye and Vision Institute with regards to a topic that most, if not all of us, are susceptible to, especially our children at home. And before we begin, we would like to get your views on this phenomenon called accommodative spasm. Answering these survey, survey questions will give us an idea on what the perception of the general ophthalmologist is with regards to the different facets of this condition. To answer, kindly bring out your phones or devices and scan the QR code to answer the poll. Okay, as you're scanning, let me read question one. Are you familiar with accommodative spasm? Again, please scan the QR code and key in your answers. Now for question number two, do you encounter this in your clinic? Once again, you can scan the QR code so that you'll be able to answer the question. All right, next question, please. Okay, question three. In your clinic, do you see these cases more in the pediatric or in the adult patients? Scan the QR code. Okay, for question number four, would you do cycloplegic refraction in these cases? Again, please scan the QR code. And lastly, scan the last QR code. Would you manage them or just refer them to a pediatric or a neuro-ophthalmologist? Okay, so now we hope those questions lit up your minds regarding this very timely topic we are about to dive into in the next few minutes. If some of you weren't able to catch the question, you may still key in your answers while the lectures are going on by going to the link that you will see below. Now, let us get into the meat of the session. The entire team of the Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus section will guide us through the different facets on the topic of accommodative spasm. I am honored to introduce my colleagues who have generously graced us with their time and effort in raising awareness and explaining the management in our ITV episode today. To explain the basics as well as define the terminologies is Dr. Carol Tagle Estrella. Carol is one of our young pediatric ophthalmologists who did her fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at the University of British Columbia Children's Hospital. Prior to that, Carol obtained her medical degree from University of Santa Tomas and finished her ophthalmology residency training at the Medical City. She is currently a consultant at the Pasig City Children's Hospital, Asia Pacific Eye Center, and Clinica Tamesis and the Medical City. Uh, next up is a discussion on optical management for those suffering from accommodative spasm. Our speaker for this part is Dr. Pat Cabrera. Pat is also a graduate of the University of Santo Tomas and the UPPGH for her medical degree and ophthalmology residency, respectively. She finished her fellowship training in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at the UPPGH Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. She is currently affiliated with the Asian Hospital, Qualimed Hospital, Asia Pacific Eye Center, UP National Institute of Health, Philippine Eye Research Institute, Rizal Medical Center, DLSU Medical Center, and of course, the Medical City. 
Pat's talk, of course, will be followed by a lecture on the pharmacological management of accommodative spasm, which will be elaborated on by Dr. Joanne Bolinao. Badge, as we all fondly call her, is a Somatian who finished her residency in ophthalmology at the Manila Doctors' Hospital, where she served as chief resident. She took her fellowship in cataract and refractive surgery at the American Eye Center, then left for the U.S. and trained for pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at the Jules Stein Eye Institute, UCLA. She now practices at the American Eye Center, the Medical City, RMC, and Cainta Municipal Hospital. It is also important to know the psychogenic management of this condition, especially for us clinicians who will get directly who will get to directly explain and recommend rules and guidelines to the kids' parents. Dr. Ann Karen Lee Ong will guide us through this part. Karen is a graduate of the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center and subsequently finished her ophthalmology residency at the Manila Doctors Hospital. She trained for pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at the DOH Eye Center, East Avenue Medical Center. She is currently the Vice Chair of the Manila Doctors Hospital Ophthalmology Department and the Section Head of the Pediatric Ophthalmology Section at the Among Rodriguez Memorial Medical Center. James finished his residency training as Chief Resident at the PGH Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. He underwent fellowship training on pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at the same institution and pursued further training at the Rotterdam Eye Hospital. Currently, James is a clinical associate professor at the UP College of Medicine and is affiliated with RMC, American Eye, and the Medical City. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we now listen to the pediatric ophthalmologists of the Medical City Eye and Vision Institute. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody is doing well. We shall start off by defining some terms usually associated with the commutative spasm. Asthenopia, or what is more commonly known as eye strain, is characterized by fatigue or tiring of the eyes. The usual symptoms include blurry vision, periorbital and or ocular pain, or discomfort, headaches, at times nausea, and diplopia. Symptoms usually occur after a period of intense visual work. A commutative spasm is a condition caused by prolonged contraction of the ciliary muscles. In literature, it is sometimes used interchangeably with ciliary spasm. Since it is an asthenopic condition, we expect that it manifests with symptoms of asthenopia, such as frontal headaches, blurring of vision, especially at distance, or pseudomyopia, meiosis, an acute acquired esotropia, diplopia, sometimes macropsia or micropsia, wherein the images appear larger or smaller than what they really are, respectively. Convergence spasm is a triad of intermittent episodes of sustained maximal convergence, accommodation, and constriction of the pupils. It is characterized by variable esotropia at near, leading to diplopia. An individual may exhibit difficulty abducting the eyes, mimicking lateral rectus palsy. On straight gaze, as you can see from the first image, the pupils are mid-sized. While on voluntary convergence, as seen on the second image, left esotropia is accompanied by constriction of the pupils. Spasm of the near reflex or near triad consists of a constellation of symptoms brought about by an excessive response of the near reflex. Signs and symptoms are generally that of asthenopia. Presentation could be variable as it is considered to be an umbrella term under which a commutative spasm and convergence spasm may be parts of the spectrum of SNR. 
Hence, clinical findings and manifestations may appear in varying degrees and may not be the same for each and every individual with the condition. Pseudomyopia is an apparent myopia that is acute in onset, disappearing when the eye is fully cycloplegied. There is an increased tonus of the ciliary muscle and constant accommodative effort, bringing the far point of the eye closer than it is. Duke elders historically classified myopia into two types. Type 1 is the result of functional increase in the ciliary tone occurring intermittently after engaging in near work. It is seen in young hyperopes after prolonged visual effort and sometimes in pre-pressed biopes as they attempt to engage in near work without having to use reading ads. This type is considered to be more of a physiologic adaptation rather than a true spasm of accommodation. Type 2, on the other hand, is considered to be the true spasm of accommodation, pathologic due to its duration and severity. The ciliary muscle is in a state of a constant spasm with variable increases in accommodation reported. It typically occurs in a younger age group. The difference between the dry refraction and the cycloplegic refraction is greater than what is expected for the normal ciliary tonus, which is around one diopter. Lastly, we included convergence insufficiency, though it is not part of the spectrum of the spasm of knee reflex and is a totally different entity. However, it is worthwhile mentioning as the signs and symptoms are actually quite similar to asthenopia, though the mechanism is completely different. Convergence insufficiency is when the eyes are unable to maintain binocular function uh, while working at near. The eyes will have difficulty sustaining focus at near, and typically one eye will deviate outwards while doing so. Thank you for your kind attention, and good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to discuss the optical management of accommodative spasm or AS. Accommodative spasm falls within the spectrum of the spasm of the near reflex, which encompasses varying degrees and combinations of meiosis, excessive accommodation, and excessive convergence. Manifest refraction may show myopia, but cyclorefraction may uncover hyperopia. This finding is also known as pseudomyopia or latent hyperopia. Cyclorefraction is the key to diagnosis of this condition, regardless of the age of the patient. The goal of treatment is to relax accommodation. There is no standard treatment for AS. A combination of atropine sulfate and bifocals is the most commonly prescribed regimen. 1% atropine is typically given once to twice daily, or if side effects are not tolerable, twice a week. It is the most effective out of all the cycloplegics for the treatment of AS. Atropine paralyzes the ciliary muscle, thus breaking the cycle of spasm. It is slowly tapered over several months or years, depending on the patient's response. If it cannot be successfully discontinued, the condition may be classified as persistent. This is a case presenting with pseudomyopia discussed by Kavthikar et al. This 11-year-old had sudden onset blurring of vision for distance and near, headache, and a history of excessive near work with no anatomic eye abnormalities. Her precycloplegic refraction was minus 2 diopter sphere on the right eye and minus 1.75 diopter sphere on the left. Her cycloplegic refraction was plus 1.75 diopter sphere on the right and plus 2 diopter sphere on the left. This is a classic example of pseudomyopia. Would you give the manifest refraction or the cycloplegic refraction? For this patient, the cycloplegic refraction plus reading ads was given, together with atropine, which led to the resolution of the symptoms. 
We give plus lenses because they relax accommodation. They also provide good near vision when the patient is atropinized. Usually, we give bifocals with reading ads ranging from plus two to plus three diopters and distance correction equivalent to the cyclo refraction or the highest tolerated plus. When the cyclo refraction is plano or shows low hyperopia and or the patient doesn't want to wear bifocals, you can give monofocals. You can also try this in young children where you just give the cycloplegic refraction. In many cases, plus lenses are not enough to break spasm and atropine must be initiated. You will also encounter cases of AS in true myopes. And you have to give them minus lenses, but it has to be the cycloplegic refraction to help relax their accommodation. There's also a small subset of patients with traumatic brain injury and persistent AS who may benefit from minus lenses. In either case, cycloplegic refraction is still the initial treatment. Atropine can be given to help patients adapt to the prescription. Remember that if you give them the myopic manifest refraction, this may sustain the AS. This is an example of a myopic patient with blurring of vision at distance greater than near. Manifest refraction was approximately minus 3 diopters OU. Cyclorefraction showed a hyperopic shift. Her prescription was found to be over minus. She was initially given just the cycloplegic correction, but because she could not tolerate it, she was given atropine to help her adapt to the new prescription. London et al., after studying traumatic brain injury patients with pseudomyopia, found that those who remained pseudomyopic beyond the first six to nine months post-trauma may be recalcitrant to treatment. The full manifest minus lens correction was the only intervention that relieved their symptoms by giving them good distance acuity. Clear lens extraction, as we know, results in the loss of accommodation. And this has been shown to benefit patients with persistent AS. I will share with you two examples. The first is of a 28-year-old male with head injury and pseudomyopia. He had an unstable refraction and blurred distance vision despite glasses. Best vision was obtained with atropine, but he was intolerant of the side effects. So they decided to perform clear lens extraction with monofocal IOL implantation, which effectively resolved his symptoms. He was given reading glasses for near vision. The second case is a 20-year-old male with no organic lesions and was on cyclopentolate and bifocals for five years. He had good distance vision but could not tolerate the glare and halo effects of cycloplegia. Every time he discontinued the cycloplegia, the uh, symptoms would recur. Increased severity and frequency of attacks prompted his doctors to perform clear lens extraction with multifocal IOL implantation. His symptoms resolved and he did not complain of glare or halos. He also did not need to wear reading glasses. In summary, all patients suspected of having AS must undergo cycloplegic refraction. The most commonly prescribed regimen is 1% atropine sulfate plus cycloplegic correction with near ads. Care must be taken in giving over minus prescriptions as this can sustain the accommodative spasm. For a specific subset of pseudomyopic traumatic brain injury patients, Manifest refraction was shown to relieve symptoms. For those uh, for persistent AS and those recalcitrant to treatment, clear lens extraction was shown to be an effective cure. Um, while this lecture focused on optical correction for AS, we must not forget to consider and address the underlying etiology. These are my references, and I would like to thank you all for listening to this lecture. Hello everyone, I'll be presenting cases of a commodative spasm and its pharmacologic management. Our first case is an 18-year-old female who came in for blurring of vision. 
She was previously diagnosed to have glaucoma and was actually on prostaglandin drops on presentation. She has never worn glasses, but on manifest refraction, was a minus 175 and a minus 125 with best vision of only 2030 and 2025. Our glaucoma specialist examined her and did not agree that she has glaucoma. She was lost to follow up until four years later when she went back because her vision was worse. She also had LASIK in another eye center, but her manifest refraction was minus 350 and minus 150 with a best vision of only 2160 and 2040. So why was her myopia higher and why was she not corrected to 2020? Cornea refractive, retina, glaucoma examined her and did not see anything wrong. They referred her to Neurofta, who requested for an MRI, and the MRI was normal. So Neurofta referred to Peds Ofta for psychopegic refraction, which was actually a plus 2 and a plus 450. We now go to the second case. Our second patient is a 36-year-old female who has been seeing her eye doctor for the past six months because of blurring of vision, headache, and diplopia. Her eye doctor referred her to a neuro-ophthalmologist for further evaluation. On manifest refraction, she was a plus one on both eyes corrected to 2020, similar to her old glasses, but she still complains that she is still seeing blurry, it was out of focus, and it was not stable. Motility exam, motility exam was normal, the disc, except for the 0.7, was healthy looking. So the visual field was requested and MRI, both of which came out normal. She was then referred for pediatric ophthalmology for cyclopedic refraction, and her actual refraction was a plus 3 and a plus 250. So there was a delay in the diagnosis of both cases because we don't routinely do cyclopegic refraction, and it's understandable if you're not a pediatric ophthalmologist. But a commutative a spasm, although it's uncommon, is not really rare. And we often not recognize it or misdiagnose it because when we are faced with a patient who could not see clearly, we think right away of pathologies in the retina, in the optic nerve, without verifying first her manifest refraction with a cyclopegic refraction. The prolonged contractility of the ciliary muscles can cause pseudomyopia, and pseudomyop pseudomyopia can throw off your manifest refraction. So cyclopegic drops will not just be diagnostic, but will also be therapeutic for these cases. Most of us will have tropicamide in the clinic. It's good to have cyclopentolate as well. These two short-acting drops will have an effect in 40 to 60 minutes, minutes which can help you with the diagnosis, but not strong enough to break your spasm. Trapeque may be, may be used for some mild cases, but not cyclopentolate, because as we all know, it is potent and it can cause psychosis and trigger seizure. The gold standard would still be your atropine. But again, we know that the peak is in three days, so you still have to give that drops for three days, three times a day before you can do your retinoscopy. The dosage and duration will vary per patient since the presentation and response will differ as well. So you have to customize your treatment. Abrupt discontinuation may also cause sudden recurrence, so we have to gradually taper it and combine it with appropriate lenses. So what happened to case one? She was on weekend atropine, so that's one drop atropine every Saturday for, the past, for six months. Then she has been stable with the current refraction for five years already, but uses atropine as needed when the spasm recurs. The second case is on her second week of three times a day atropine. She was given the full cyclopegic refraction with a, with a reading ad. So going back, notice that with the spasm, the pseudomyopia can reach a minus six in our young patient, like the first case and a minus two in the pre press biopic age, like the second case. Those numbers would actually fall under the range of their amplitude of accommodation for their age. If we recall our donor stable, even a 60-year-old or a 65-year-old can still accommodate a minus one. So do not forget your cyclopegic refraction, especially for cases undergoing refractive surgery. 
Like in our third case, a 32-year-old female who came in for LASIK. She has no complaints, no headaches, no blurring or whatsoever. In fact, her glasses and our manifest refraction was exactly the same. But on cyclopedic refraction, there was around 175 to 200 difference. So what would be your target? So we had to postpone the LASIK, make her try the atropine refraction first for a month. When she came back, she was not happy with it. So we had to adjust the refraction to the least minus that she can tolerate. And that would be the target for LASIK. So she ended up having a minus 1.5 treated instead of the minus 275. And her UCBA for the past two years is still 2020. Uncorrected. So remember to do your cyclopedic refraction. Your cyclopedic agents are not just diagnostic but therapeutic as well. It will be a long and challenging course, but you have to help the patient. So when AS recurs, you have, you have to combine it with glasses. You have to resume the drops. Clear lens extraction, maybe if we have accept, exhausted all efforts, but that's not our first line of treatment. Thank you and keep safe. Thank you, Drs. Carol, Pat, and Badge. May I just remind everyone that if you haven't answered our poll questions yet, you may still do so through by scanning our QR code or by visiting our bit.ly link posted below. And again, all your questions for our speakers are very much welcome. Let us take a short break now and listen to our sponsor for today, Stada. Preservatives and eye drops damage the ocular surface. For Laboratoire TA, respect for the ocular surface has always been a priority, as has the excellent tolerability of our products. As a consequence, most of our formulations benefit from the ABAC system. ABAC system has been the subject of 10 years of research, development, and testing. ABAC system is made from a complex and yet very precise combination of a number of constituent parts. The flexible and ergonomic wall is made of low-density, additive-free polyethylene. A locking system also includes a tamper-evident ring. A neutral microporous pad allows air and liquid flow to be regulated. This hydrophilic polymer membrane is rendered partially hydrophobic by a patented surface treatment. ABAC system is completed with a rounded protective tip. ABAC system is a multi-dose dispenser of 10 milliliters of sterile solution which is equivalent to 300 preservative-free drops. ABAC system delivers precisely calibrated preservative-free drops. Once the drop is expelled, the membrane filters the residual drop and the air to compensate the depression. ABAC system is easy to use, flexible, and ergonomic. ABAC system is designed to preserve the integrity of the eye. ABAC system, the preservative-free eye drop dispenser with 0% preservative and 100% tolerance. ABAC system is the first and now most widely used multi-dose preservative-free bottle in ophthalmology practice, with more than 15 million units sold worldwide.
Good morning, everyone. I will be presenting the psychogenic treatment for accommodative spasm. Accommodative spasm is often attributed to a psychogenic condition associated with stress, anxiety, and personality disorders. In the literature review done by Hindman, they tabulated seven case reports that mentioned the use of angiolytics, antipsychotics, antidepressants, and antispasmotics in treating accommodative spasms. I was able to retrieve six out of seven case reports. Let's start with the use of IV benzodiazepine. In 1988, Ohashi presented a case of 57-year-old man with head trauma that had a long-lasting organic spasm near reflex. They observed the patient for conversions and meiosis for one year and three months. The patient did not have lateral rectus palsy. They injected the patient intravenously with benzodiazepine and found a persistent convergence and meiosis to disappear within seven minutes and was even able to make a normal near reflex after the spasm disappeared. They concluded that the effect of benzodiazepine suggests that the disturbance of the GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid inhibitory system in the near reflex may be responsible for the occurrence of the spasm. In the second case report, valproate was used. A nine-year-old was admitted with prolonged and recurrent near reflex accommodation spasm, which was sole clinical manifestation of primary generalized photosensitive epilepsy. She was started on small dose of valproate and became asymptomatic within the first day of treatment, along with normalization of EEG. The underlying neuroanatomic interconnections of the accommodative near reflex and spasm has been theorized to originate in preoccipital cortex, lateral suprasylvian area, and anterior occipital lobe. Abolition of epileptiform discharges from these regions alleviate circuitry of electrical signals and hence abate the disorder of ocular movements. They concluded that EEG should be included in the diagnostic battery of any patient presenting acutely with abnormalities of ocular movements. The third case used diazepam, an anxiolytic benzodiazepine. This was a case of hyperactive, impulsive, irritable seven-year-old who complained of intermittent diplopia. After a thorough ophthalmologic examination, he was diagnosed with convergence spasm with childhood emotional disorder owing to an emotionally unavailable mother. She was given atropine eye drops and plus 1.5 lenses for bleeding and diazepam 2 mg per RM one month after initiation of antipsychotic medications. The patient's ESO deviation at near result, decreasing the required duration of atropinization of the eyes from the conventional therapy of several months to a year. They concluded that early resolution of convergence spasm is possible with addition of antipsychotic medications, reducing the prolonged use of atropine, therefore decreasing the prolonged side effects of atropine such as photophobia and difficulty in reading at near. The fourth case uses promethazine, an antipsychotic medication. This fourth journal is interesting because aside from the reporting, from reporting the use of promethazine, an antipsychotic in treating convergence spasm, Gordon also reported four cases of convergence spasm elicited by positional changes, mimicking benign paroxysmus positional vertigo. Promethazine is an antipsychotic phenothiazine derivative. Clinically, it causes antiemetic and sedative effects. They recommended considering the possibility of positional convergence spasm in cases of positional dizziness. The fifth case applied IV methylprednisolone. In the American Journal of Emergency Medicine, a very rare type of paroxysmal phenomena in multiple sclerosis was presented. A 37-year-old female complained of frequently repeating diplopia attacks. Can you imagine about 20 to 40 times a day lasting a few seconds or a couple of minutes? The patient had chronic active plaque in the pons. The probable cause is epileptic nerve transmission in the regions where the disease has been active before. The patient was given IV methylprednisolone. The patient recovered completely. The sixth case used bromocryptine. 
bromocryptin resets dopaminergic and sympathetic tone within the central nervous system. The last case also presents paroxysmal conversion spasm in multiple sclerosis. This is a case report of a 25-year-old female with paroxysmal conversion spasm lasting up to 20 seconds and occurring about 80 times per day, triggered by hyperventilation. Patient also had associated brainstem lesion in the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which the authors felt was the cause of ocular manifestations. The patient was treated with bromocryptine. From the six case reports presented, it is interesting to note not, on, not only the treatment used, but also the underlying causes identified by the, these six case reports. Psychogenic treatment for accommodative spasm targets the underlying cause such as anxiety, demyelinated lesions from multiple sclerosis, and positional dizziness. Patients want relief immediately, and conventional treatment such as atrium Atropinization may be too long and side effects too intolerable. In the future, when faced with patients with accommodative spasm, we may consider co closer collaboration with psychiatrists. Thank you. Good afternoon. Today, I'm going to discuss the role of vitamin B12 in asthenia. Vitamin B12 has been postulated to improve the accommodative responses in patients with asthenopia. An example of vitamin B12 eye drops still currently in the market is Antopa, marketed by Sandin. The following studies I will present are very old studies, and many of the methods they use are outdated or not available already at this time. The first study was done in 1974 by Dr. Akihiro Suzumura, entitled The Effects of Vitamin B12 Eye Drops on the Accommodative Function of Asthenopic Patients, especially on the PEHG. The idea that vitamin B12 might be useful in patients with asthenopia started when 75% of individuals who are carriers of fish tapeworm was found to have low vitamin B12 levels as compared to non-carriers. And these individuals, incidentally, also suffered from asthenopia. This led them to theorize that vitamin B12 supplementation might improve accommodation and therefore be used to treat asthenopia by affecting accommodative kinetics. It was also during this time that vitamin B12 was gaining popularity as supplementation for peripheral neuropathy. It was found that asthenopic patients had increased variability in the near point of accommodation and had a longer accommodation time or the time needed to adjust accommodation depending on the distance of the target. In this study, they used the photoelectric accommodograph, or PEAG, an infrared optometric apparatus, to objectively assess accommodative response. They used this machine to assess the different, the different effects of several visual stimuli and drugs on accommodation. This recorded the accommodative responses of amitropic eyes, including floating accommodation, or the status of the ciliary muscles without the accommodative load. Floating accommodation is also said to be the most objective parameter of accommodative function. In healthy young adults, the peak of floating accommodation is at 1.2 to 2.0 Hz. In elderly presbyopic adults, the peak is only at 0.5 Hz. It was found that drugs that paralyze accommodation, such as atropin, increases the 0.5 Hz components, which was similar to pseudomyopic and asinopic individuals. This parameter is what they want to measure. If vitamin B12 will decrease the low frequency components in patients with asthenopia. There were 13 participants in the study. Eight patients were treated with vitamin B12, while five patients were given placebo eye drops. The participants were aged 19 to 50 years old, and all patients had a chief complaint of eye strain and or blurred vision, and all were diagnosed with accommodative asthenopia. Pertinent ophthalmologic findings include persistent eye strain even after correction of refractive error in those with impaired accommodative function using an accommodative volumeter. The eye drops were used once to two times, four times a day for one week. The patient's baseline and post treatment accommodative poly recorder and PEAG measurements were recorded. For the accommodative poly recorder, they measured the far point and two centimeters from near point of accommodation. 
They did 10 repeated measurements for positive and negative accommodative responses. For the PEAG, the far point and the 33 centimeter proximal to the far point measurements, as well as the floating accommodation measured 10 centimeters farther than the far point were also taken. The results showed that patients in both groups had improved subjective responses, although no questionnaire was used in this study. They also found that patients in vitamin B12 group had significantly decreased low frequency component as compared to the placebo group. However, although found to lower floating accommodation, the mechanism of action of the vitamin B12 eye drops is still unknown. Of course, there are many limitations to this study. First is the small sample size, and another is the wide age range with presbyopic patients probably confounding the data. The lubricating effect of the eye drop itself may also be the reason why all patients reported improvement in their symptoms. A second study was done by Yamaji et al. in 1976, which was basically almost the same as the first study of Suzumura. This time, they had 45 patients, with 23 patients placed on vitamin B12 drops and 22 patients placed on placebo eye drops. The age range was limited to pre presbyopia from 15 to 35 years old. There were more females than males, and all were diagnosed with accommodative astenopia. The dosage for the drops was one to two drops four times a day for a longer duration of two weeks. They also used a standardized medical interview questionnaire about their symptoms and all underwent routine ophthalmic examinations. Again, the APA monopoly recorder and PEAG measurements were noted. Subjective symptoms improved again on both groups based on the post-treatment questionnaire. Vitamin B12 showed improved floating accommodation with decrease in low frequency components, as well as shortened mean positive accommodating latency and time. Both of the reported studies on vitamin B12 are extremely old and newer studies are needed to verify the claims that vitamin B12 is an appropriate treatment for astenopia. Thank you very much. I would like to remind everyone to send in your questions through the comment section. Now to give a brief summary of the lectures and presentations we just saw, I am honored to introduce one of our esteemed colleagues, Dr. Faye Charmaine Cruz. Faye obtained her medical degree uh, from the University of Santo Tomas and subsequently finished her residency training at the Medical City. She did her fellowship training on pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at the University of California. She is currently the section chief at the UERM Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Service and a fellowship consultant at the East Avenue Medical Center, DOH Eye Center, as well as the Medical City Eye and Vision Institute. Dr. Fay. In summary, the increased accommodative amplitude will not create a problem, but it is the sustained accommodative tone or the inability to relax accommodation that will trigger the spasm. The current work from home scheme encourages an increase in computer use leading to a sustained accommodative tone. A person will exhibit symptoms of headaches, wearing of vision, and fluctuating visual acuities as showed by cases reported earlier. Physical examination will present with meiosis and disappointing reflections. In fact, the hallmark of accommodative spasm is the substantial difference between your manifest reflection and cyclopegic reflection. Hence, a cyclopegic refraction is always warranted. There is no hard and fast rule in managing these cases. As presented earlier, cyclopegic agents given once or twice daily is one of the mainstay. The duration of treatment can range from two weeks to six months, 
then we may even give cloth lenses to assist the patient for new work. Prescribing minus lenses can also be an option since they will exhibit pseudomyopia. However, by prescribing minus lenses, it may contribute to the sustained accommodative spasm. Last, we advise practicing good visual habits, such as reading in a well-lighted environment and frequent breaks. In extreme conditions, a digital break may be necessary. In conclusion, we cannot stress the importance of accurate history and the use of psychopedic refraction in these cases. We have to accept the fact that accommodative problems will require more of our time and maybe much more than we care to spend. In behalf of the TMC Pedia Opta team, we would like to thank you and stay safe. Patty, I think you're on mute. Okay, uh, let me take over while Patty is figuring out her technical issues. Thank you for that concise but effective summarization of our topic for today, Faye. Truly, accommodative spasm, uh, sabi ni Google, accommodative spasm, is a problem that cannot only affect our children, but is in fact a problem for us all as we glue ourselves more to our screens and books, especially during these times. And just to show you how relevant this is, we have tons of questions, Patty. I hope you can join me soon. There are a lot. Let's call back our speakers to try and answer the questions that our audience have been aching to ask. Uh, can we see the questions already or are we going to show the poll first? Okay, let's show the polls. Uh, Patty is still having some technical issues, ba? Okay, let me see. Um, are you familiar with accommodate, accommodative spasm? 79% said yes, so that's good. Let's try the next question. We ask you if you encounter accommodative spasm in your clinics. Uh, we see about 65% saying they, they do see it. Um, and then I don't know what it is for 6%. Well, I'm glad you're here to listen to our lectures. And for 25%, they don't see it. No? Okay, let's start with three. Let's continue. In your clinic, do you see cases of accommodative spasm more in the pediatric or the, in the adult population? And uh, for up to 11%, they say they don't know what that is. We see it in the adult population, up to 50%, and in 24% of our pediatric patients. We expect to see more of these because uh, students are going to start studying online. Okay, number four. Would you do cyclopedic refraction in cases of accommodative spasm? Um, majority of you, 63%, did say yes. I'm surprised there is a good 15, 15 of the respondents who did not uh, want to do a, a cyclopedic refraction. And still the same 8 to 11, 8 to 11 persons who do not know what accommodative spasm is. So thank you for attending this lecture. Okay, and number five, would you manage cases of accommodative, ay, naku, okay, accommodative spasm 
or refer them to a pediatric ophthalmologist or a neuro ophthalmologist. Okay, most of you will say I will refer to a specialist. So, but hopefully after we teach you today, we taught you today, you can now start managing these patients in your own locales and in your own clinics. No? And uh, we're more than happy to accept your um, referrals, but you can do this. You can, we can deal with this. We can do this together, okay? Okay. So let's see, let's start with our viewers' questions. I think Dr. Villa is still having some technical issues. Let's see, uh, I'm waiting for the questions. I think we have a lot of questions from the audience. Uh, let me call on our speakers. Our speakers are my... Okay, here are all my speakers. That's Dr. Faye Cruz, Dr. Karen Lee Ong, Dr. Bolinao, Dr. James Lee, Dr. Pat Cabrera, uh, that's Dr. Carol Tagle, and welcome back, Dr. Patty Villa. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, okay. loud and clear. Can you remove my headset? So now maybe it's time for us to answer a few questions. Shall, shall I start the first question, Dr. Yes. Apolline? Yes, because I've talked a lot already. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. okay, the first question is, do you always give full cycloplegic refraction? Who would like to answer that? Um, yeah, I can, can answer that. Cabrera? Cabrera? Yes, correct. Yes. Uh -uh. So... In in most cases, we give the full cycloplegic refraction, especially in children. In adults, you can give the highest tolerated plus, but remember that it might take more than one visit to get the ideal prescription for, for the patient. If the patient is given atrophy, then it's important to give to give um the plus lenses so that the patient will be able to see at a uh, good vision at distance and also at near. I think uh, Dr. Bolinao can add to that because I think she presented some adult patients that are experiencing, that were experiencing accommodative spasm. Okay. Most patients will start with their cycloplegic refraction. Because eventually, they, it will change. As you taper the atropine, if the spasm is still active, it will the their glasses will need to change. They will need to change their glasses. So at first, yes, you have to give the full cyclopedic refraction with the reading ads, tint sometimes because the glare would also annoy them. But once you taper it off, you will have to change that to a little minus. But um, make sure that you just retain it to the closest you know, refraction to the atropine refraction. To all of you, let me let me add uh, questions. To all of you, start with atropine right away because I know I've started with uh, short-acting cyclopedic refraction first in the in the clinic. Oh, okay. So initially, you can start with the short-acting just to know. Pero parang rapid test mo lang siya. If you want to confirm, you still have to do your atropine refraction later on. So no, after, but uh, uh oh, okay. correct. Continue. Sorry. But yeah, I remember um, you have a paper before. You can also use the combination tropic, phenyl, and um, cyclopentolate, TPC. Actually, it's quite close to atropine. Oh, this is, this is you're talking about cycloplegic refraction, no? But mm -hmm. uh, what I was talking about is do you prescribe uh, any of the cyclopegic agents to your patients also? Atropine, only atropine. Uh oh, how I've started a few cases on tropicamide uh, okay. to see if it will work for them no, before I commit them to atropine. I don't know about the others. Yeah, um, in my case, I also start with tropicamide. But um, in very severe spasm, usually if they are taking their final exams or in extreme stressful conditions, 
sometimes I really need to um after the exam I shift them to atropine too. Yep. Correct. Okay, we can maybe tackle the next question. Okay, for the second question is, what is your technique of cyclorefraction when using cyclopentolate? And do you prefer to reserve cyclopentolate for adults? Okay, any Who one lectures? of us? Who lectured on pharmacology? I think it was a uh, bad <laughs> So yeah, but, yeah, I mentioned oh, yeah, you can use cyclopentolate for children and adults as long as they don't have seizure. So that's a yeah. contraindication if the patient has history of seizure because it can trigger. I've seen one. Um, uh -huh. You can. It's better also to dilute it. Uh, no, not dilute. Combine it with tropicamide and phenyl, the TPC, because that's closest to your atropine in the clinic. But I would normally still verify it with an atropine refraction later on. But doing that in the clinic, you have an idea if there's a spasm or not. Okay, the problem okay. with the problem with cyclopentolate is it's not readily available. No? Yeah. So some of us have, especially those of you who are not uh, routinely seeing a lot of cases, you will probably end up using atropine more than cyclopentolate. But we use it both in adults and pediatric patients. Okay, let's for, for, for our for our audience, um, in case you would encounter seizures in the clinic, um, I I'd just like to ask the speakers, what do you usually do? What do you advise when that that seizure episode happens in the clinic? Called the doctor. And in that particular patient, it was an it was an absent seizure. Eh? So I was doing a I don't know if it was the cyclo cyclopentolate or the light that actually triggered the the seizure. Eh? So the mom knows na mana doctora magsi seizure because nag eyeball rolling and nag absence or nag ano siya nag stop lang. Tapos nag regain naman right away. Yeah, I actually, most of these cases are like only temporary they're not really permanent mm -hmm. and then when the effect goes away they get better so you just give it like a few hours give them lots of water and if there's an er close by you can also ask the parents to bring the child there just to be sure what i've seen right. is not i uh, know what i've seen is not uh absence seizure what i've seen is a Drastic change in behavior, parang possessed behavior siya, parang just the different, oh, parang like psychosis, correct. Uh, we just hydrated the patient and let the uh, medication get diluted wear. and take, oh, yes, and wear mm -hmm. off. But uh, I saw it in training, I saw it in Jules Stein, I never saw it again here in the Philippines. No? So, uh, but if you don't want to use it, it's okay. Just yeah. leave the cyclopentolate to us. <laughs> <laughs> and also another thing, I, uh, I've never encountered it personally, but another thing is we don't treat cyclopentolate like sandmade wherein you put one drop every 15, every 15, means and umaabot up until five doses. Um, yeah. When I give cyclopentolate, I, I just try to limit it one. Kung kaya ng one, if you can do it with one drop uh, and the patient is well cyclopeach, I stop there. If the patient needs another drop, I limit it until two drops, two doses only, five to ten minutes apart. Okay, I think one of the questions, I think the question asks, how do you give cyclopentolate? No? And when do you refract? Maybe we should remind uh, everybody how to do that. Maybe James, so we can hear your voice. <laughs> so usually when we do our cyclopentolate, we put one drop. Uh, five to ten minutes apart, uh, maximum of two drops, just like uh, what Carol said. And then we refract after around four, 30 to 40 minutes uh, from the last drop. So that's the usual uh, way when uh, we do our cyclopedic refraction with cyclopentolate. Okay, thank you very much. That's the common mistake. Eh? Uh, you mm -hmm. don't wait long enough. Yeah. I'd also and like to add. Uh, I'm sorry. And yeah. don't wait for the eyes to, or the pupils to dilate. That's not your end point. We have to remind everyone that that's not the end point of the cycloplegic uh, drug, no? We, our end point is to wait for the medicine to, um, to cycloplege the eye, no? Yeah. So th your end point is not to dilate the eye. 
Yeah, okay, Dr. Faye. When you do your retinoscopy and you notice that the pupils are moving, then you still have to wait it out. Um, ideally, when you do your retinoscopy, the pupil has to maintain it. It's not moving and static. Then I'm pretty sure that the accommodation is already paralyzed by that time. And you can actually add fixation at distance even if your patient is cycloplege. No? Yes. You ask the patient to look at a big target at distance so yeah. that your patient can still, if there relax. is some residual accommodation, relax. that patient can still relax the accommodation a little bit. Yeah. No? So your biggest E or your biggest C. Okay? Okay, next question. Okay, for the next question, the third question, can convergence spasm be considered to be a form of convergence excess isotropia? Maybe we can ask Dr. Tagle, Dr. Carol, to answer this. Okay, um, technically, not really. Strictly speaking, it's not really um, one and the same because uh, as regards convergence excess isotropia, it's a type of convergence squint wherein um, there is a um, near distance disparity of more than of 8 to 10 percent diopters, more ET at near or more isotropic at near than at distance. Um, so the patient can be isotropic at distance or orthotropic. Uh, however, um, and it usually occurs in a, in a younger, you know, children, younger age group. It's usually detected in a younger age group. And um, there are some associated fusional abnormalities. Uh, in convergence spasm, as we have uh, mentioned earlier, it, it the this conjugate gaze at near stems from it stems from an exaggerated response of um, the near triad, and it usually happens in an, or is seen in an older age group, usually middle uh, middle school to a younger adults, and um, majority of cases are functional in nature. Okay, can we have the next question? Would a combination of tropicamide phenylephrine eye drops have a role in cycloplegic refraction? Is it enough to diagnose accommodative spasm if atropine is not available? Uh, who do we call? Ghostbusters. <laughs> Let's see, Dr. Leong, so I can hear your voice also. I, do you want the question flashed? Yes, again. again please. <laughs> not, not paying attention. <laughs> That's not the question. The question before that, please. Uh -oh. Would combination tropic eye drops have a role in cyclopegic? Yes. Okay. As mentioned earlier by Dr. Bolinao, we do the tropicamide, phenylephrine, PPC, and cyclopentylate uh, combination to do to simulate yeah. an in refraction so it's the closest that you can get now if you do not have a uh, uh, cyclopentylate uh, I have used uh, sorry I'm gonna see the brand nano Sunmead to uh, do refraction but again uh, you have a residual still na accommodation uh, with it so it's just to see how of sometimes because say the patients come in they, they they have already glasses that you already uh, uh suspect accommodative spasm so there's some that yeah you can use sun need to estimate if there is accommodative spasm but it will not give you the the true psychologic reflection yes agree okay very good next question please Okay, for the next question, will there be a big difference if AR is used instead of a retinoscope to get the cyclorefraction? AR is automated refraction, no? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's not our friend. That's not the pediatric <laughs> ophthalmologist friend. Uh, let Kali. me see. Let's see. Dr. Okay. Bolinao, maybe. Or Dr. <laughs> Dr. Bolinao and Dr. James can answer Should that it? because they work in an eye center, in a high volume eye center, and they use the AR a lot. Depends if calibrated yung AR. <laughs> but oftentimes, oftentimes naman, if you, um, I would do the, the, the cyclo and compare it with AR. There's a little difference, depending on the machine. It would depend on the machine. 
but usually I would still rely on my cyclopedic refraction and not the AR. Correct. Dr. Reyes? Dr. James? Ah, so, Ma'am, if you're going to look at studies, no, uh, AR uh, results, if compared with uh, retinoscopy results, would usually give you a more myopic uh, refraction and uh, it can give you a, an idea uh, on what the refraction is, but it's not going to be very accurate. So, uh, uh, with with regards to studies, ma'am, they will always say that the gold standard would still remain to be your retinoscopy, especially in these cases of um, uh, accommodative spasm, because we want to give them a, 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 a more hyperopic or a less minus refraction. So uh, the AR might give you an idea uh, of what the refraction is, no, but uh, it's not a good, it's not very reliable to give you the true refraction of your patients. Correct. Your your automated refraction will actually stimulate uh, convergence and uh, instrument convergence no so you might get artificially myopic prescriptions so more minus or also maybe with the rule astigmatism no? it's still the same error we always harp about when we lecture about cyclopedic refraction and automated refraction no? so that's why many of the pediatric ophthalmologists will probably not have an automated refractor paninda lang yun sa pasyente tsaka it's a good starting point but you still have to confirm your cyclopedic refraction the way you know how to do it no? so full cyclopedia or as much cyclopedia as you can use during that visit and ask your patient to fixate at distance at a big target so that will help you get your uh, cyclopedic refraction okay can i add something yes. but your ar sometimes can tell you if the patient has a spasm so it will make you change no may minus six may minus four may minus yeah. two so oh. if you see that drops na cyclopedic refraction oh uh -oh. variable mm -hmm. no? uh -oh. very good mm -hmm. yes okay next question okay for the next question can patients wear progressive lenses instead of bifocals hmm. who, who answer who lectured on optical management it was dr pat cabrera no cabrera yeah mm -hmm. yes ma'am yes so uh, you can give progressives instead of bifocals, and young adults will prefer this because of the aesthetics. Um, but in, in young children, however, the reading segment in progressives is a little bit low, so they may not learn how to use it. Um, the best really to prescribe in children are executive bifocals with a segment line bisecting the pupil or um, flat tops with a higher segment line. You can also give uh, progressives um, with, a, with a large uh, reading segment. Um, yeah, it, so, and, and it is also important to remember that, that some of these patients will not, will not need the atropine for a long time. So you will have to, the atropine and bifocals, so you, you may need to inform them about this so that they, they can um, decide, as this was, will help them decide what, what uh, lens to buy. I have a question. How many patients have you had to refer for psychiatric management or at least psychological relaxation techniques? Doc, uh, let's see, Dr. Fay. Yeah, <laughs> Sigur, um, most of the time, it's really stressed and loose, but very rare do I need to refer to a psych, psych referral, to give them a psych referral. Did you teach them um, how to relax? No. <laughs> 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 um, I think it's chair time. You really have to explain what the problem is. And when they start to accept na the, the, there's so much only that I can do for them, then they start, you know, accepting the idea and relax. Um, ang issue ko kasi, I see a lot of med students, diba, before, because I was in UERM. So I really see an increase pag malapit na yung finals nila. So sometimes, I really do need to give them reading ads to assist them. Kasi dinadilate ko sila, so kawawa naman, they won't be able to answer their exams. But eventually, after everything is done, I need to put them on atrophy just to break the spasm. Okay. Karen, how many have you sent for psychiatric or psychological <laughs> alone? Psychological management. None of us, but see, Ms. Dr. Rafi, you, you already 
just based on history, you identify that it is stress induced or there is anxiety. So uh, you just tell them, explain to them that these are contributing factors. So I guess it's just like a cardiologist advising a cardiac patient to let go of the stress. Yeah. Yes. They can see, yeah. Okay, let's answer the next question. <laughs> <laughs> For the next question, is there a danger of permanent loss of accommodation following prolonged cycloplegia? So is this going to be something permanent? No. I think that's the fear no. of the other ophthalmologists. No. Uh, the no. Recurrent Who answers, action. Who answers yes? Raise your hand. Who answers no? Action. Raise your hand. No. <laughs> No, 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 question. no permanent. No permanent. You lose it when you age. <laughs> Actually, um, I think yeah. when. <laughs> when not, oh, wait, wait, wait. Ang gulo natin. Sige. I think the concern of the prolonged use of these drops is not the loss of accommodation, but the side effect that is associated with it. So, um, as mentioned by Dr. Raboli, now you can give um, atropine eye drops to break these uh, accommodative spasm. But keep in mind the side effect of these drops: severe glare and then uh, difficulty reading at near. But the loss of uh, permanent loss was it the question? Permanent oh, correct. Loss yeah. Accommodation is not the fear. Yeah. Actually, magre recur siya if you stop. In lalo na yung abrupt discontinuity. You would actually yeah. you would see by recurrence. So yeah. I saw I saw one of the cases you presented. I saw one of the cases you presented, Dr. Bali. Now you started the patient on atropine and then eventually you had to titrate her glasses and you ended up treating Paren for a little bit of myopia, yes. correct? Uh -oh. Yes. Yeah. She's actually she's 21, 21, 22 years old. So a plus two. No, yeah, she can accommodate that very well. So she can tolerate it. So okay. most of the time, my colleagues would ask me kung how much yung ika cut. You could actually, I think, I don't know if all of you will agree, but not more than two. So mga one, minus one, minus 150, but that should be, that's tolerable. Hindi na yun masyadong magkakos ng spasm din. Yeah. Okay, next question, please. Okay, for the next question, is there a rule for oral muscle relaxants in the treatment of accommodative spasm? I guess that's muscle. me. <laughs> okay. um, the muscle relaxants, uh, it's not, there is one study, I read it, it's, it used chlorazoxazone. Uh, but then again, this, medicine is systemic so it can relax all the other muscles uh, on top of the ciliary muscles being relaxed so parang we shy away from using systemic or uh, muscle relaxant uh, my lecture addressed uh, presence of psych psychiatric conditions so the the medicine actually is treating a uh, present psychiatric condition, uh, anxiety or um, psychosis. Okay, very good. I hope that next answered question. your question. <laughs> yeah, it did. I think it did. <laughs> okay, next question, please. <laughs> Do we still have questions? Do we still have questions? Ha, hmm. huh, I think that's I all we it. have. Okay. <laughs> we have. <laughs> Where's our team? Uh, uh, okay, I think we're done with, I think that's the last question. I think mm -hmm. we have exhausted all our questions for tonight. Thank you to our sections consultant for their time and knowledge to make this episode worthwhile. For those of you who would like to brush up on the topics discussed today, we have an accommodative spasm course that will be launched to the Medical City Enterprise Lifelong Learning Academy. This platform contains both internationally developed courses and the Medical City owned courses to provide continuous learning for the healthcare industry. 
And to know more about this platform and obtain access to this course, do not forget to register to this event and fill out the attendance and evaluation forms posted on the comment section. For the next episode, it will be one of the few ITVS episodes we have set for the month of August. This is an episode in partnership with Mundi Pharma, which will focus on how to maximize glaucoma medications to be given by renowned glaucoma experts in the country. This specific episode is our small contribution to raise the awareness of the public during the Sight Saving Month we celebrate during the month of August. Watch us live on August 13, Thursday, 5 p.m. via our YouTube channel. And I would like to take this opportunity to express our gratitude to today's sponsor, Stada. You may add our official TMC EVI Facebook account to access details of our episodes and to get notified for new live videos through our YouTube channel. Please do click on the subscribe button below and we'll see you all at, on the next episode. Again, I am Pauline Santiago. And I am Patty Villa. Thank you for watching episode 5 of TMC ITV entitled, When You Move, I Move. Thank you all for being a part of our TMC ITV. And we hope you'll join us again as we further explore of Town Week Instruction Without Borders. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs>